Hi, I'm Jeanette Yoff, and I'm a psychotherapist working with children in foster care and adoption. And I'm here to help you understand some ways of supporting your child, whether you're a parent by adoption, a parent by foster care. So now we're going to talk about grief interventions. One of the most important pieces in helping a child with their grief and loss is we want them to understand their adoption story. And an adoptee or foster child benefits from hearing painful information about their past because they will know you are telling them the honest truth. Even if it's hard for you, it will be healing for the child. He or she is having some of the ugliest and most painful information about his past revealed by you. Yet at the same time, you are demonstrating that you love him or her just as they are. So more tips for explaining their story. If you have photos, let the child see them. If they want to keep them, let them have them. If you want to make copies of the original photo, please do so. Again, children are egocentric. They will believe in their hearts that they were rejected by their birth family. And that is, it is their fault. And the reason they are no longer with their birth family is never their fault. And kids need to hear this over and over and over again. They did not do anything especially bad to make this happen because babies aren't that powerful. That's why prefacing the facts, letting them know that it was not their fault and they couldn't have stopped this from happening no matter how powerful and reassure them that they are loved and you will help them understand and they are not responsible. So I'm going to show you a video that I made for kids called What is Adoption? It's an animation to help kids understand there are many reasons why a child is adopted. So what is adoption? Some families just can't live together. So it's necessary to find another family who will love and take care of the children. Becoming part of a new family is called adoption. Here are some reasons why families can't live together. Some people are just too young to be parents. They have no experience to raise a child. Some parents want to keep their babies, but their families don't support them. Some moms have a baby, but there's no dad to help her, and she feels like she can't raise the baby because it's really hard to do it all by yourself. Sometimes a social worker or judge decides it would be best for a child to be adopted because some parents may have a serious problem with drugs or alcohol, not been kind to, or even physically hurt their child and need some parent training. Some may have gotten scared and moved away, leaving the baby all alone. Some parents are unable to provide food, clothing, and even a safe place to live. Some parents may have died. Some parents may be in jail for breaking the law. Some may have had a physical or mental illness and need hospitalization and medical care. Remember, it's not that they don't want to parent, they just can't parent, like a child needs. Most times, there's a team of people working to help keep the family together. Social workers are helpers for parents and are also there to help the children feel safe and cared for. They will try and help solve problems by creating a family case plan. Sometimes the plan calls for a child to live in foster care with foster parents, while their first parents work on problems with the social worker. But if the problems can't be fixed, an adoption plan is made. An adoption plan is made by the first family and a social worker who collectively decide it is the best thing for the health of the child. A judge then helps to finalize the adoption plan and provides a permanent home for the child. So you see, a social worker is a very important person in adoption because they have to find a family that is best for the child and they are there to be kind and supportive. Even still, sometimes finding a family can take a long time and that's why some kids wait in a foster home, a group home, or with a relative for a while until the parents, social workers, and judge can figure things out. The bottom line is, children need love. When you are adopted, it means you have a new family a new relationship as a daughter, a son, a sister, or a brother. And you have become a very important part of your new family. It's important because you will be sharing all of life's experiences together. Birthdays, holidays, vacations, and so much more. 
You will have many questions about your birth family, and you have every right to wonder and know the story of your adoption. Ask your parents by making a question box and see what answers you can find and what answers you can hold on to in your questions box. You may have numb feelings. You may have angry feelings. You may have, was this all my fault? Guilty feelings, which brings along sad and confused feelings. All of these feelings are normal because you are grieving the loss of your first family and the grief is also normal. You will need to grieve in order to feel better. There is no right, there is no wrong. Expressing your feelings can sometimes be hard, but the more you can do it, the better off you'll be. Big feelings will come and big feelings will go, like a great big wave, so just go with the flow. Don't push them away, make them your friend, so you can understand your grief and go play again. Remind and tell yourself over and over that being adopted is a very special thing. Out of everyone in the world, it was you that they would bring to their hearts, to their homes, to their whole family too. And the last thing to know, to take deep in your heart, is that you're just a kid. It was never what you said or did that made your first family break apart. You matter! But one thing to remember, you are not alone. There are 1.5 million children currently adopted in the United States. Between 1 to 2 million couples want to adopt a child, and 40% of adopted children are of a different race, culture, or ethnicity than both of their adoptive parents. And 6 out of 10 Americans have personal connection to adoption. Each year there are 135,000 children adopted in the United States. And overall, there are 7 million people adopted in the United States. That's amazing! All of these people were adopted too. Colin Kaepernick, Faith Hill, Jamie Foxx, Run DMC Daryl McDaniels, David Thomas, Wendy's founder, Steve Jobs, Marilyn Monroe, Simone Biles, Sarah McLaughlin, Christian Chenoweth, Ray Liotta, Blondie, Keisha Cole, Liz Fair, and many, many more. You are not alone. Okay, what are the emotional needs for children? And this is coming from the child's point of view. I need help in recognizing my adoption loss and grieving it. If I don't grieve my loss, my ability to receive love from you and others will be hindered. I need to be reassured that my birth parents' decision not to parent me had nothing to do with anything defective in me. I need help in learning that absence doesn't mean abandonment. I need permission to express all my adoptive feelings and fantasies. Validation needs. I need validation of my dual heritage. That's my biological heritage and my adoptive heritage. I need to be assured often that I am welcome and worthy. And I can tell you that adoptees, you're not going to cause a narcissist. We need to hear we matter a lot. I need your validation that I have suffered a profound loss before I came to you and you are not responsible. I need to be reminded often by my adoptive family that they delight in my biological differences and appreciate my birth family's unique contribution to our family tree through me. Here is an intervention that I do with a lot of kids who come to my practice and we create their family tree and the materials you're going to need is that poster board, a tree cut out, a leaves cut out, some tape, markers, and paint, and photos if you have. I tell a child that we are going to draw your family tree. And first, we're going to put a tree. You can draw a tree. You can cut out a tree. We're going to put it in the middle. Then we're going to draw the ground. And then we're going to put in the roots the seeds that grew you and helping kids understand how babies are born and that all babies are born this way so the children can make sense that this is a shared experience whether you are adopted or not. A wonderful book that I like to read with kids is called What Makes a Baby and this book uh, really helps children understand that there's an egg and a sperm 
that go into the woman's body. The sperm has his story and then the egg has its story and together they do a dance and they share each other's stories and they become one. It's really a wonderful book to read with kids. And I usually like to read it when we're doing this, before we do this, and then we talk about, do you wanna have seeds or do you wanna have the egg and the sperm? If we have the names, we put the names on the seeds. If we don't have the names, I'll have a child say, what do they want to call them? So we give them permission to have a say in this experience. And then the tree is the family by adoption and leaves represent the family that they see most often as extended family members. And then utilizing art, drawing the feelings in the roots, colors, and then on the sides, we put photos. Now, typically I'm just doing the one card presentation, and then I'm going to put uh, the poster board on the side, and I'll explain why that's important, is create a door, a front door secure with a security code. Why? Because this I want to teach them is their story and there are boundaries. And a boundary is a way for you to, when you feel open and want to share, you open and share your story. When you don't feel comfortable or don't want to share or don't want to talk about, then you close the doors. Basically, when you have your one piece of poster board, you put another poster board on top, you tape it to the side, and you cut a line up the middle, and the child can create a code that only they know, so they know how to get into their story and sharing their family tree with anyone that they choose to. And what I like about this is helping kids understand that, you know what, sometimes it's okay to not talk about this with some people. Not everybody is ready. Some people may have a lot of questions and you not, may not be ready and prepared to answer all those questions. So when you are open and ready, you can share. And when you're not, you can have a healthy boundary. And the child can then put this somewhere in their room uh, where they can revisit it, look at it, and make sense of their experience. And then this other family tree is with a road metaphor. This is a child who'd been in three foster homes. And it's another type of family tree that I do. And this again includes the poster board, tree and leaves cutouts, as well as houses, tape, string, markers, and paint. Same concept on the bottom is your roots, who grew you, your birth family, are they seeds, is it the egg and the sperm, can we name it? And then we can draw a road to show your journey. So after you were born, where did you go to next? You went to your first foster home. We can put pictures of who lived there, dates if we know put feeling colors next to these different placements. So I like to use the four feeling colors. Mad is red, scared is purple, glad is happy is yellow, and sad is blue. Mad, sad, glad, and scared. And then the, the final placement of the tree is their family by adoption. And then on the bottom, I put a hole in the paper with a scissor. I put a string in that and I tape it on the back of the poster board. I pull the string all the way up to the top and I lay it flat. And then I put a hole in the top of the tree. And before I put it through the hole, I'll have the child write their name on a leaf and if I can laminate it, I can laminate it. If not, I use clear tape. And then I'm going to poke a little hole in that and put that on the string. And then put the string through the top, push the string through, tape it to the back securely. So now we have this line that connects the child from their birth family 
to their foster family, to their adoptive family. And they have this trajectory and they can now travel along and go back and forth because here is the experience. The child will go back and forth, thinking, remembering, reminding, retelling their experiences. And this is part of the healing process. So this string provides this through line of their life. And what are we really doing here? Making sense, bringing this out. The parents joining with the experience, understanding how they feel, putting words, pictures. So this is another type of intervention, uh, family tree, helping kids make sense of their stories. And again, for this, you do the same concept, closing the two flaps on top and having a security code. Another intervention that I do with kids is my questions and answers box. And I usually do this when we're doing the family tree because kids don't have all the answers. And guess what? They're holding a lot of questions. Just because a kid's not actively talking about their experience does not mean they're not actively thinking about it. So a question box is another way for them to release all these thoughts that they're having put them in a place, a containment, a psychological container, which also contains the grief and the loss. And I does an inventory of the losses of all these questions that they don't have answers to. So you need two boxes, one for the question box, one for the answer box. Crayons, markers, index cards, and or sticky notes. Uh, stickers, you can decorate the box name it, this is my question box, this is my answer box. And the way this works is uh, you sit with your child, you say, hey, we're gonna make a question box because we can only imagine you have so many questions about your story, and your birth family, and it's totally okay, and you can ask us anything, and we're gonna put all these questions in a box. You can start with some fun questions, why can't we have pizza for breakfast, and then, once all the questions are in the box, you can ask the child, what two questions would you like an answer for? And guess what? You will get an answer a week from today because we will do our research and see what answer we can find. And if we don't have an answer, we'll keep it in the question box until we do. I also tell kids not all questions have an answer yet. And this provides a stalling tactic for parents because I know I was a kid who asked my mom at the strangest of times and she wasn't prepared or ready to answer my questions. Why was I adopted and where is my birth mom? And she didn't know what to say. And she could have used and I could have benefited from her saying, that's a great question for your question box. And then she would write it down or I would write it down, put it in my question box to go, hmm, now someone's acknowledging, someone sees, someone hears me, someone knows me, and they're looking out for me. And I'm going to wait and hopefully get an answer in a week or not. But at least someone's acknowledging and knows what I'm thinking. So the question and answer box, the parents have a week um, to find the answer, consult with an adoption professional, how to answer the questions. Uh, there's some wonderful books on how to answer tough questions. Take a week, figure out the answer, age appropriate for the child, and then provide that answer. And then that answer gets written on a card, stapled to the question card, and put in the answer box. And then the child has these two boxes. They I like to keep them in their room so they have them to go to, to turn to whenever they're more curious and they want to learn and think about or put in new questions for the question box. Mm -hmm.